Dr. Watson and Dr. Uh, Dr. Kuo. Um, and I dealt with ergodic theory on respaces. Um, so uh, respace theory falls under functional analysis. And um, for this gentle introduction, there's a lot of pre preliminary results and a lot of, there are a lot of pre uh, preliminary definitions we need to give before we even get anywhere near uh, defining a respace. And so rather anticlimactically, well, we don't end on anything fancy um, with this presentation, but uh, if it's possible to present more in the future, then with the preliminary result of the way, then we can really develop a rich respace theory and see what we can do with it. So um, we're going to begin by defining a binary relation. So I know Professor Penn has uh, put a video on YouTube uh, with a binary relation, and that's going to be our starting point. And then we'll work with partially ordered sets, then define lattices, um, and then finally get into the respaces. So with the binary relations, let's begin by using the symbol equals to denote equality. So we'll say that two objects X and Y are equal, um, and we write X equal to Y um, whenever X and Y are identical. So they are precisely the same objects. And if these objects live are uh, some similar type of objects and they are not identical, then we can write X is not equal to Y and say that X and Y are distinct or not equal. And that was supposed to be erased. Whoopsie. So um, this is standard equality that we've seen before that we know and love. Um, before we get onto an equivalence relation. So we need to, it's important though, when we define the anti-symmetry of a binary relation that we know that this equal symbol is telling us that two objects are precisely the same. Um, so we'll say that if we have non-empty sets A and B and we denote by A cross B, their Cartesian product, then we call R a binary relation on A and B and in the case of A equal to B, we'll simply say a binary relation on A. Whenever R is a non-empty subset of the Cartesian product of A and B. And in the case of A equal to B, it's a non-empty subset of A cross A. Um, and then for each X and A and for each Y and B, um, so we can write X and A and Y and B, or we can take the ordered pair X, Y and A cross B. Um, we define the following. We say that X and Y are R related, or when the context is clear, we can simply say X and Y are related, and we write X, R, Y, whenever X, Y is a member of the set R. And we say that X and Y are not R related, or when the context is clear, we can simply say X and Y are not related, and we write X, not R, Y, whenever X, Y is not a member of the set R. So now we're going to take a non-empty set A and we're going to let R be a binary relation on A. So just a non-empty subset of the Cartesian product of A with itself. And we'll introduce some more terminology here. We'll say that R is reflexive if X is related to itself for each X and A. We'll say that R is transitive if for each X, Y, and Z in A, we have that X, R, Y, and Y, R, Z implies that X, R, Z. So if X, and, if X is R related to Y and Y is R related to Z, then we have that X is R related to Z. Um, and we say that R is symmetric if for each X and Y and A, we have that if X is R related to Y, then Y is R related to X. And finally, we'll say that R is anti-symmetric if for each X and Y and A, we have that if X is R related to Y and Y is R related to X, then X and Y are identical. So here I chose to use the word identical rather than write X equal to Y because um, of an equivalence relation, which we will define. Um, and so sometimes it might be a bit confusing to know if you're working with this equality or this equivalence relation. So here, we're just going to use identical. So we're going to now take a non-empty set of A, and we're going to let R be a binary relation on A. And then we'll define 
the following types of binary relations. So we'll say that R is a pre-order on A whenever R is reflexive and transitive. We'll say that R is an equivalence relation on A or simply an equivalence on A uh, whenever R is a symmetric pre-order on A. So that means R is reflexive, R is transitive and R is symmetric. And often the notation to denote an equivalence relation is the equal sign, which is why it uh, is important when we began to indicate that this equal sign is equality, um, whereas this equal sign is an equivalence relation. Then we'll say that R is called a partial order on A or a partial ordering on A whenever R is an anti-symmetric pre-order on A. So that means R is reflexive, R is transitive, and R is anti-symmetric. And we will often denote um, and take it as a given that the standard less than or equals symbol denotes um, a partial order on A. Um, so we're now going to say that a non-empty set A with a partial order, that is called a partially ordered set. Um, and we'll abbreviate it as POSET. It's easier to say POSET than partially ordered set. And we assume that each non-empty subset of a POSET inherits this partial ordering, which is defined on the POSET. So that's important, which, uh, when, uh, which it allows us when we're looking and dealing with subsets or non-empty subsets of a POSET, that we still have this partial ordering on those subsets. So um, <clears throat> the next one, I mean, just to get our terminology out of the way, we'll say that um, if A is a poset and X and Y are on A, then we'll define the following. We'll say that X and Y are comparable, and we can say comparable in A, comparable under the partial ordering. Uh, we can say comparable in A under the partial ordering, um, or any sort of equivalent terminology. If x is partially ordered by y or y is partially ordered by x now so we haven't really given a way to talk about what the notation x that symbol y means so in definition three we'll formally define how we can say this so we'll say that x and y are incomparable if x and y are distinct and neither x is partially ordered by y nor y is partially ordered by x so using our um, notation of not related we can say x is not related to y and y is not related to x um, so now to finally give a way to talk about what this means how to say it we'll say that x is dominated by y whenever x is partially ordered by y um, and it's also, since we use this inequality, we might simply just say X is less than or equal to Y, as we know from the real numbers. Um, we can also say that Y dominates X and write Y, put the symbol the other way around X, and we define the symbol going the other way around whenever X is dominated by Y. So we can also say Y is greater than or equal to X to make it sound like... Um, uh, what we already know something intuitive so then we'll say that x is strictly dominated by y and we'll write x with a strict inequality y whenever x is dominated by y and x and y are distinct and we'll say that y strictly dominates x and we'll write y with a strict inequality going the other way x whenever x is strictly dominated by y so at this point here um, we're just giving formal terminology and uh, formal definition to how we talk about these things. Um, so now we'll say that um, if A is a poset, um, then the partial ordering on A is called a linear ordering, or I've missed something, or a total ordering on A. I uh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Um, so we'll say that if A is a poset, then the partial ordering on A is called a linear order or a linear ordering on A, or a total order or a total ordering on A if every pair of members of A 
are comparable and a non-empty subset of A, say B, is called a chain in A whenever every pair of members of B are comparable in B. So it's important that when we have a post set, it is not always the case that every pair of members of the post set are comparable. And so with the real numbers and the standard ordering, we know that each pair of members of the real numbers are comparable. So the real numbers is a totally ordered set. But if we consider something like um, R2, uh, that is a partially ordered set. And we can find members of R2 which are incomparable under the ordering we define. Often we can take the pointwise ordering. So the, I have examples of respaces, and I've left the examples for the respace section. Um, but we, so we will get to it, and we will see we will how all of these things fall into place in a concrete setting. So now we'll say let X be a post set, and let A be a non-empty subset of X. Then we'll define the following. We say that X is an upper bound of A and X. If X is a member of X and A is dominated by X for each member A of the set A. So let's just make sure we got the right one here. Little X and X. Let's go through this again. We call a little X an upper bound of capital A and X. If little X is an X and little A is dominated by little X for each little A, in capital A. Um, and then we'll denote by this U of AX, the set of upper bounds of A and X. So we can formally write it as U of AX is the set containing X and X, such that A is dominated by X for every A in A. And finally, we'll say that A is bounded above in X whenever there is at least one upper bound of A in X. And so equivalently, we see it means that the set of upper bounds of A and X is a non-empty set. Uh, we now define lower bounds that's very similar to upper bounds. So we'll say let X be a post set and let A be a non-empty subset of X. Then we say that X is a lower bound, little X is a lower bound of A in X. If little X is a member of X and little X is dominated by little A for each little A, in the set A, and we will denote by L of AX the set of lower bounds of A and X. So that is L of AX is the set containing little x and x, such that x is dominated by A, little a, for all little a in the set A. Um, perhaps I should have chosen some different notation there to make it easier to talk. But anyway, um, so we now say that A is bounded below in X whenever there's at least one lower bound of A and X. And this is equivalent to saying the set of lower bounds of A and X is non-empty. Then putting the two together, we'll say that if X is a post set and A is a non-empty subset of X, then A is bounded whenever A is bounded below and A is bounded above. Um, so this is a generalization of what we've seen with the real numbers that we have um, a non-empty subset of the real numbers is bounded above if there is a real number which is greater than or equal to every member of that subset. We say that a non-empty subset of the real numbers is bounded below um, if there is a real number which is less than or equal to every member of that subset. And we'll say that the non-empty subset of the real numbers is bounded when it's both bounded above and below. So <clears throat> this is drawing some parallel or from the real numbers to now this abstraction for the post sets. So the next definition, we can introduce a maximal element and a largest element of a post set. So we'll say let X be a post set and let X star be a member of X then we say that x star is a maximal element of x if little x is an x and x star is dominated by little x implies that x star is equal to x and we call x star the largest element of x if little x is dominated by x star for every little x and x so um 
if we think about uh, the um, closed interval zero one, then the maximum, uh, the largest element of zero one is the number one. So if we make our post set the closed interval zero one, we have that the largest element of that interval is the number one, since every member of that interval is dominated by one. Um, so now we'll say um, that if X is a post set, then X star in X is the largest element. Uh, and if X star in X is the largest element of X, then X star is the only maximal element of X. <clears throat> So let's look at the definition of a maximal element. And it looks almost like a largest element. But since we have a partial ordering, it is not the case that every member of the post set is comparable to X star. But if we have that every member of the post set is comparable to this maximal element, then we call it the largest element. And it is unique. So let's prove this by supposing that x is a post set um, and x star in the post set is the largest element then by definition we have that every little x and x is dominated by x star and so if we take any little x and x and if we have x star is dominated by x then it is clear that x star is equal to x by the anti-symmetry of the partial ordering. And so this shows that the only maximal element of X is the largest element of X. Um, so now we'll say given any Y and X, which is a maximal, uh, beg your pardon. So we've shown that um, X star is a maximal element. So now we want to show that the X star is the only maximal element, that the largest element is unique. So given any Y in X, which is a maximal element of X, and given any little X in X, such that Y is dominated by X, then we have that Y is equal to X by the definition of a maximal element. But we notice that um, if X star is dominated by Y, then X star is equal to Y since X star is itself a maximal element. And so this implies that if Y is any maximal element of X, then Y is X star. So, <clears throat> so we have shown that the largest element of a post set is a maximal element of a post set and it is unique. So we now look at pretty much the opposite a minimal element and a smallest element. So we'll say that if X is a post set and if we let X star be an X, then we say that X star is a minimal element of X. If little X is an X and X is dominated by X star implies that X star is equal to X. And we say that X star is the smallest element of X. If X star is dominated by little x for every x in the post set x. So if we turn our attention to the closed interval 0, 1 in the real numbers, then we see that it is a post set because of the ordering defined on the real numbers. And we have that the number 0 is the smallest element of the closed interval 0, 1, since the number 0 is less than or equal to every member of the closed interval. Um, so now, similar to the proposition we had for the largest element, we say that if X is a post set and X star in X is the smallest element of X, then X star is the only minimal element of X. So in other words, the smallest element <clears throat> is the unique minimal element. So um, the proof is very similar to the proof uh, for um, the uniqueness of a law of the largest element. So if we let X be a post set, then we suppose that X star is an X is the smallest element of X. Then by definition, we have that X star is dominated by little X for each little X in X. And so if we are given some little X in X, and such that little x is dominated by x star, then x star is equal to x. 
by the anti-symmetry of uh, the partial ordering. And this implies that X star is in fact a minimal element of X. So now we've shown that X, the smallest element is a minimal element. So now we want to show that the smallest element um, is the unique minimal element. Mm, that's bad spelling. So <clears throat> given Y in X, which is a minimal element of X, then if little x is in x and x is dominated by y, we have that y is equal to x by the definition of a minimal element. Notice, however, that if y is dominated by x star, then x star must be equal to x since x is the smallest element. And so this implies that um, x star is the only minimal element of x okay so <clears throat> that was just a quick brief introduction to the binary relation and to post sets with not much else happening so now we want to more move into lattices um so we need to develop a little bit more with post sets before we can define a lattice so we first will define the supremum of a subset of a post set. So we'll say let X be a post set and let A be a non empty subset of X. Then little a is said to be the supremum of A in X. Whenever A is bounded above an X, little a is an upper bound of A in X, and little a is dominated by X for each X and upper bound of A in X. So the supremum is the least upper bound of x it is the smallest this is why we needed to define smallest and largest element it is the smallest element of the upper bounds of a um, now we simply we will write by soup a the supremum of a or we can use the lattice notation um, a v v a and we may call soup a the least upper bound of a and x and furthermore for each x and y and x we use the notation x v y or we can say x soup y to denote the supremum of the set containing x and y if the supremum exists so it is not always the case that the supremum exists so firstly if a non-empty subset of a post set is not bounded above then the supremum does not exist immediately since the supremum needs to be an upper bound of the set and if there is no upper bound or the set is not bounded above then we can never find the supremum it does not exist but secondly even if the set is bounded above it is not always the case that the supremum of the set exists since the supremum needs to be comparable with every member of the upper bounds of the set and it needs to be the least member um, so in the set of real numbers we have that a non-empty subset which is bounded above has supremum because all of the upper bounds are comparable because the real numbers are totally ordered but if we have a partially ordered set where not every pair of members of the set are comparable it's not always the case that all of the lower of the upper bounds are comparable so it's not always the case that the supremum exists when the set is bounded above so it's a little subtlety we need to um, remember so um, we now define the infimum the abs uh, the generalization of from the real numbers to any post set so we'll say if x is a post set and a is a non-empty subset of x, then little a is said to be the infimum of a and x. Whenever a is bounded below an x, little a is a lower bound of a and x, and x uh, is dominated by little a for each x a lower bound of a. So then we'll denote by uh, the, this um, little a, this infimum, we will write inf a or we'll use this lattice notation um, wedge a and we may call in the infimum of a the greatest lower bound of a and x so looking at the largest elements we see that the infimum of a 
is the largest element of the set of lower bounds of A. And we have that it is unique. And we see it from the definition. So furthermore, we'll say for each X and Y and X, that the notation X wedge Y, or we can say X inf Y, is defined to be the infimum of the set X, Y, and uh, if this infimum exists. And just like the supremum, it's not always the case that the infimum exists. So firstly, of course, if the non-empty subset A is not bounded below, then there is no infimum, since there are no lower bounds and the infimum needs to be a lower bound. But if the subset A is bounded below, it's not always the case that the infimum exists for we need the infimum to be comparable to every member of the set of lower bounds. And so if that does not happen, then we can never find the greatest or the um, largest lower bound. So um, again, with the real numbers, we have that every non-empty subset of real numbers, which is bounded below, has infimum. But when we move into the case with partial orders, it's not always the case that every member is every pair of members are comparable. So it's not always the case that we have um, an infimum uh, when a set is bounded below. So <clears throat> I've mentioned a lot with the real numbers. We have these nice properties which happen. And so now we're going to see which sort of post sets exhibit nice properties. So if we let X be a post set, we'll say that X is order complete or simply complete if every non-empty subset of X has both supremum and infimum. Now, this is quite a strong condition. So to have an uh, order complete post set means that every non-empty subset has supremum and infimum. We don't even care what's going on with the bounds. But of course, if supremum exists, it is bounded above. And if infimum exists, it is bounded below. Um, we'll say that the power set X is dedicant complete if every non-empty subset of X which is bounded above has supremum and if every non-empty subset of X which is bounded below has infimum. So now this dedicant completeness um, gives us a property which we see with the real numbers. We know with the real numbers that every non-empty subset of real numbers which is bounded above has supremum and every non-empty subset of real numbers which is bounded below has infimum. So immediately we see that the set of real numbers under the standard ordering is a dedicant complete partially ordered space set. Um, so this property of dedicant completeness is now the generalization for of what happens with the real numbers. Um, so now we'll say that X is called dedicant sigma complete, sigma for sequence, um, or sometimes countably dedicant complete, if every non-empty countable subset of X, which is bounded above has supremum, and if every non-empty countable subset of X, which is bounded below has infimum. So the subtlety between dedicant complete and dedicant sigma complete is that dedicant complete can take any non-empty subset. It doesn't have to be countable, whereas dedicant sigma complete requires that the non-empty set is countable. Okay, so now we'll make a proposition that um, if X is a post set, then the following statements are equivalent. If every non-empty subset of X which is bounded above has supremum, then every non-empty subset of X which is bounded below has infimum. And if every non-empty subset of X, which is bounded below has infimum, then every non-empty subset of X, which is bounded above has supremum. And finally, this is equivalent to saying X is dedicant complete. Oh dear, where's the proof? Um, okay. Um, I don't know where the proof has gone. Uh, so we'll have to talk our way through this one. So what we'll do, we'll say let X be a post set and let's suppose that every non-empty subset of X which is bounded above has supremum. Now let's take any non-empty subset of X, let's call it A, and suppose that it is bounded below. 
then it means that the set of lower bounds of A is non-empty. And since every lower bound of A is dominated by every member of A, we have that the set of lower bounds of A is bounded above. And by our assumption, every subset which is bounded above has supremum. This gives us that the set of lower bounds of A has supremum. But this supremum is dominated by every member of A, which means that it is, it's the greatest lower bound, but it is the smallest um, member of A, if it lives in A. And in fact, it is dominated by every A, which means that it is the infimum of the set A. Um, so now, for, so this... Um, for point number two, if we have that every non-empty subset of X, which is bounded below, has infimum, then every non-empty subset of X, which is bounded above, has supremum. So um, the proof is similar for part one. Uh, so if we assume the hypothesis and we let A be a non-empty subset of X, which is bounded above, then the set of upper bounds of A is non-empty. And the set of upper bounds of A is bound below by A itself. And since the set of upper bounds of A is bound below, and by hypothesis, every bound, set bounded below has infimum, we then have that the infimum of the set of upper bounds of A exists. But this infimum is greater or dominates every member of A. So the infimum of the upper bounds of A is the supremum of A. And then putting those together, this statement tells us that it's, uh, and this statement gives us that the set is dedicant complete. So that just follows by definition. Right, so now um, we can finally introduce a lattice. So we'll say that um, if X is a post set and every pair of members of X have supremum, then we call X an upward lattice. And we'll say that if X is a post set and every pair of members of X has infimum, then we call X a downward lattice. And we'll say that X is a lattice whenever it is both an upward lattice and a downward lattice. So a lattice has that it is um, a post set, or X is a lattice, whenever X is a post set, every pair of members of X has supremum, and every pair of members of X has infimum. Okay, so now, <clears throat> if we let X be a post set, then we def uh, the following statements hold. If X has a smallest and largest element, then X is order complete, if and only if X is dedicant complete. And if X is order complete, then X has a smallest and largest element. So um, again, I don't know where the proof is. Um, that's gone missing. So <clears throat> we'll have to talk our way through this one as well. So let's suppose that X is a post set. And let's suppose that X has a smallest and largest element. Then to show um, that X is order complete if and only if X is dedicant complete. If we take any non empty subset of X, that non empty subset, of course, is always bound above by the largest element of X and it's always bound below by the smallest element of X. And we um, have that every non empty subset is both bounded of X, is both bounded above and below. Um, and since by the definition of order completeness, every non-empty subset of an order complete set it has supremum and infimum, it then gives us that every non-empty subset of X, which is bounded above has supremum and every non-empty subset of X, which is bounded below has infimum, which means that X is dedicant complete. And for the converse, if we suppose that X is dedicant complete and we let a be any non-empty subset of X, then it means that if A is bounded above, it has supremum, and if A is bounded below, it has infimum. But every non-empty subset of X 
is bounded above and it is bounded below since there is the smallest element and there is the largest element, which means every non-empty subset of the Dedekind complete set has supremum and infimum, which implies that X is ordered complete. Um, now for the next one, if X is ordered complete, then X has a smallest and largest element. So to prove this, we'll say let X be a post set and suppose that X is order complete. Then it means that every non-empty subset of X has supremum and infimum. And so if we take X to be the non-empty subset of X, X has supremum and X has infimum by the definition of order completeness, which means that there is a member of X which dominates every member of X, the largest element, and there is a member of X which domin it's dominated by every member of X. So that is the smallest element. So our next proposition I've skipped the back. Okay, there we go. So now we'll say um, let X be a lattice. So that means that every pair of members of X has supremum and every pair of members of X has infimum. And we'll let X, Y, and Z be members of the lattice such that X is dominated by Z and Y is dominated by Z. Then it is clear that the supremum of X and Y is dominated by Z since z is an upper bound of x and y and the supremum of x and y is less than or equal to every upper bound of x and y so this gives us that um z dominates x sup y so now um for any x y and z and x since both x inf y and x inf z are majorized by x inf y sup z it follows that x inf y sup x inf z is dominated by x inf y sup z so um this is something which holds for every lattice so now we'll make a definition and we'll say that the lattice x is said to be distributive if we have equality in this expression so that is x is a distributive lattice whenever x is a lattice and x inf y sup x inf z is equal to x inf y sup z for all x y and z in the lattice x so um we can look at this distribution property like um multiplication and addition so yeah if we have let's say x plus y multiplied by x plus z. Um, we can, oh, what am I trying to say? I beg your pardon. So, um, did I write? Oh, gee. So, we can view this um, distribution like multiplication and addition. So, here we have um, x multiplied by y plus z. Um, we can multiply it out. That gives us X plus Y. I mean, X times Y plus X times Z. So it looks similar to some distributive property of multiplication and addition in a ring or particularly in a field. Um, and so this is why we'll say that this is called a distributive lattice when this property holds. So um, we'll now say that if X... Uh, X is a distributive lattice if and only if X sup Y inf X sup Z is equal to X sup Y inf Z. So if we look at the definition, we're taking the infimum and then the supremum. Uh, we're distributing um, the infimum over the supremum. Um, and so now our equivalent statement is that we can distribute the supremum. Um, so <clears throat> let's suppose that X is a lattice and let's suppose that X is distributive. Then by definition, we have this equality holds for all X, Y, and Z in X. So let's just make things a bit easier to write. And let's say, let's define W to be the supremum of X and Y. So this gives us that 
the infimum of w and x sup z is equal to w inf x sup w inf z. So now we replace w by x sup y. So this expression becomes x sup y inf x. And this expression becomes x sup y inf z. And we have the supremum floating around in the middle there. Now by the distribution, we can then expand this and write it as x in x soup y in x so um and then soup x in z soup y in z so it is getting quite messy um but if we follow with it we're just doing um the distribution from the fact that the lattice is distributive so we're distributing from here to here and then we're using that distribution property again to get that this expression gives us x soup y in x soup x in z soup y in z now since f um since y in x is dominated by x and x in z is dominated by x we have that x soup y in z soup x in z is equal to x itself which gives us the result that we need um, so the converse to the statement is proved similarly. So if we suppose that this holds true, then we do pretty much everything we've done here, but change the soup for an inf and change the inf for a soup. And we will get the result that X is a distributive lattice. So <clears throat> let X be a lattice. Then we'll define the following. We'll say that theta is the zero element of X whenever theta is the smallest element of x. And we will say that E is the unit element of x whenever E is the largest element of x. So if we look at, again, um, the closed interval 0, 1 in the real numbers, the zero element is the number 0, and the unit element is the number 1. So now we've got some basic... Um, lattice stuff out of the way so that we can start moving on to finally defining a re-space. So the first thing is we'll define a partially ordered vector space. So we'll say that E is a partially ordered vector space whenever E is a real vector space and E is a post set such that for each F, G and H and E and for each alpha a real number which is greater than or equal to zero we have that if f is dominated by g then f plus h is dominated by g plus h and if f dominates the null element in e then alpha f dominates the null element in e so this these two properties are extending the partial ordering to um the vector operations. So uh, we know, of course, if F is equal to G, then F plus H is equal to G plus H, which lives in the vector space. And so now we're extending that to the partial order, saying that if F is dominated by G, then F plus H must be dominated by G plus H. And we also know that F is in a vector space, then alpha F is in the vector space. So here we want to include the fact that if F dominates the null element of the vector space and we multiply by a positive scalar, then it still dominates the null element in the vector space. So now we'll say um, that if E is a partially ordered vector space, then F is called a partially ordered vector subspace of E whenever f is a vector subspace of E and f is itself a partially ordered vector space. So that means that f is a non-empty subset of E and f is a partially ordered vector space itself. So now what we're going to do, we're going to show that if E is a partially ordered vector space, then f is a vector subspace of E, if and only if f is a partially ordered vector subspace of E. So to prove this, we'll suppose that E is a partially ordered vector space. And this means that E is a post set and it is a real vector space. And every non-empty subset of E inherits the partial ordering on E. 
So if f is a vector subspace of E, then f inherits the partial ordering on E, since f is a non-empty subset of E. And so we also have for each f, g and h and f, and for each alpha, a real number with alpha greater than or equal to zero, we have that f plus h, g plus h, and alpha f are in f, since f is a vector space. And so this then gives us that if F is dominated by G, then F plus H is dominated by G plus H. Since F plus H and G plus H live in F, which is a subset of E, and E is itself a partially ordered vector space. Um, and we also have that um, if F dominates the null element in F, then f dominates the null element in e because it is the same null element and so alpha f then dominates the null element in e but alpha f lives in f and so we have that alpha f dominates the null element in f so this shows that uh, if f is a vector subspace of e then it satisfies the definition to be a partially ordered vector space and so it is a partially ordered vector subspace of e now, conversely, if F is a partially ordered vector subspace of E, then by definition, F is a vector subspace of E. So that one is done um, quite easily. So now, this result is going to prove to be very important um, in showing that we only need to show um, a test that the supremum of every pair of members exists in a partially ordered vector space to show that it is a re-space when we get to defining a re-space. So <clears throat> this result we need to hold on to quite firmly. So we'll say let E be a partially ordered vector space and let A be a non-empty subset of E. And let's define minus A to be the set containing minus little a such that little a is an A. Now, if the supremum of A exists, then the infimum of minus A exists and the supremum of A is equal to minus the infimum of minus A. And if the infimum of A exists, then the supremum of minus A exists. And the infimum of A is equal to minus the supremum of minus A. So to prove this, we'll let E, assume the hypothesis, we'll let E be a partially ordered vector space, we'll let A be an non-empty subset of E, and we'll define minus A to be the set containing minus little a, such that little a is in A. So, if we suppose that the supremum of A exists, and if we denote by U the set of upper bounds of A and E, then U is non-empty. Um, we also have that minus X is dominated by minus a for each upper bound x. So since a is dominated by x um, and e is a vector space, meaning that e is a group under its vector addition, um, we can use the group properties to show that if a is dominated by x, then minus x is dominated by minus a. And so this means that every upper bound of A is a lower bound of minus A. And we also have that, um, so we have that minus A is bounded below. And so we also have that if A star is the supremum of A, then A star is dominated by every upper bound of A, which means that minus X is dominated by minus A star for every x and upper bound of a so this implies that minus a star is the infimum of minus a so we have that the infimum of minus a exists and we have the infimum of minus a is minus a star which is minus the supremum of a so then we can move the minus around and we get supremum of a is equal to minus infimum of minus a now to prove the second statement that if the infimum of A exists, then the supremum of minus A exists and the infimum of A is equal to minus the supremum of minus A. We're going to do pretty much the exact same thing, um, but we're going to replace 
change the order of the inequality and work with the set of lower bounds. So we'll show that every lower bound of A is an upper bound of minus A. And so that the infimum of A, which is the greatest lower bound of A, becomes the least upper bound of minus A. So the infimum of A is the supremum um, of minus A. And so the infimum of A is equal to, similarly as we've done here, is equal to minus the supremum of minus A. So um, we now will define some lattice stuff with vector spaces. So we'll say let E be a partially ordered vector space. Then we'll say that E is an upward vector lattice whenever X sup Y exists for each X and Y and E. So in other words, E is an upward lattice and E is a partially ordered vector space. We'll say that E is a downward vector lattice whenever the supremum of X and Y exists for each X and Y and E, meaning that E is a downward lattice and E is a partially ordered vector space. And then we'll say that E is a vector lattice whenever E is an upward vector lattice and a downward vector lattice. Um, so now, using this result uh, over here, we're going to show that if E is an upward vector lattice, then E is a downward vector lattice. And so E is a vector lattice. And if E is a downward vector lattice, then E is an upward vector lattice. And so E is a vector lattice. So in other words, if E is a partially ordered vector space, then these statements are equivalent. E is an upward vector lattice, E is a downward vector lattice, and E is a vector lattice. So to prove it, we'll suppose that E is a partially ordered vector space. Now, we'll suppose that E is an upward vector lattice, which means that every pair of members of E has supremum. But since E is a vector space, we have that minus X and minus Y live in the vector space. And since every pair of members of the vector space have supremum, we have that the supremum of minus X and minus Y exists. And so that is itself a member of the vector space, which implies that minus minus x minus y exists it lives in the vector space and using our result that the supremum of a is equal to minus the infimum of minus a we have that for each x and y and e x inf y is equal to minus minus x minus y exists and so e is a downward lattice and so now it's both upward and downward which means that it is a vector lattice now the proof to show that if E is a downward vector lattice, then it is an upward vector lattice um, is similar, but we'll interchange supremum by infimum. Um, and then use prop, uh, point number two of this proposition. So finally, if E is a vector lattice, then E is both downward and upward by definition. So all of these three are equivalent statements. So one is equivalent to two, um, one implies three, three implies one, um, two is equivalent to one, so two implies three and three implies two. So we finally define this re-space object. Uh, so we'll say that E is called a re-space whenever E is a vector lattice. So a vector lattice is a re-space. Um, furthermore, we'll say that F is a re-subspace of E whenever F is a non-empty subset of E and F is itself a re-space. So that means whenever F is a partially ordered vector subspace of E and each pair of members of F has supremum and infimum in F. So importantly, those supremum and infimum must live in F. They do exist because E is a re-space, but we require them to live in the subset. So finally, some examples of respaces. So if we consider the set of real numbers equipped with the standard ordering, then we know that R is a partially ordered set. We also know that R is a real vector space. And by the partial ordering, uh, or by this total ordering, we know that the properties required to be a partially ordered vector space are satisfied. So R is a partially ordered vector space. And furthermore, we know that 
every pair of members of R have supremum, since every pair of members of R are bounded above in R. And so R is a respace. Now, if we take Rn, and let's just let n be a natural number greater than or equal to 2, and we equip it with the pointwise ordering. So that means we'll say that um, a member x in Rn and a member y in Rn will say that x is dominated by y if and only if each component of x is dominated by each component of y. So that pointwise ordering is a partial ordering. And so we then have that R is Rn is a poset. We also have that Rn is a real vector space. And under this pointwise ordering, we have pointwise addition and pointwise scalar multiplication. So we'll then have that Rn is a partially ordered vector space. Um, furthermore, if we define with this pointwise ordering, the supremum of X and Y to have that its components are the supremum of each component of X and Y, then each member of Rn, each pair of members of Rn has supremum. And so Rn is a respace. Um, so these are not the most interesting ones. What is more interesting is L0 of X and mu. So um, we'll say that X and mu is a measure space and we'll set L0 of X and mu to be the set of all equivalence classes of um, A measurable functions. Um, and we'll say that the mu almost everywhere ordering is that F is less than or equal to G, if and only if F of X is less than or equal to G of X, for mu almost every x in the set x. Um, then we have uh, addition is defined almost everywhere and uh, scalar multiplication is defined almost everywhere. And mu measurable, I mean, a measurable functions map from the set x to the real numbers. So we have that L0 <coughs> is a real vector space. We have that the mu almost everywhere ordering is a partial ordering so that L0 is a post set. And we also have that under this partial ordering, it satisfies the conditions to be a partially ordered vector space. We also then have that every pair of members of L0 has supremum. Since we can bound above each pair of members by their absolute value. And we know what the absolute value is since f of x and g of x are real numbers for each x. So we can <clears throat> easily get the absolute value since we have absolute value on the real numbers. And so each pair of members has supremum. So L0 is a respace. Oops. And now we'll let L1 of x a mu equip it with the mu almost every ordering for a measure space x a mu. Um, be the set of all L0 functions such that the integral of absolute F is finite. Then we have that L1 is a re-subspace of L0, since each member of L1 is a member of L0. Then the last one um, is if we let M sigma of XA be the set of all sigma additive signed measures on A, for a measurable space XA, and we equip it with the pointwise ordering, then M sigma is a respace. Now, in this case, the pointwise ordering will say that um, mu and nu are ordered pointwise if mu of A, let's say B, if mu of B is less than or equal to nu of B for um, measurable sets B. Um, so, a lot of these examples, the interesting ones, or three of them, um, have been dealing with um, measure spaces. And so, respaces do play a prominent role with the measure theory. So, we're now going to say that if E is a respace, then its positive cone, E plus, is the set of all members of E which are 
greater than or equal to zero, uh, greater than or equal to the null member, a uh, null element of E. And we'll say that each F and E plus is called a positive element or a positive member of E. Um, now, this is unconventional, but we'll introduce it. Uh, so we'll say that if E is a respace, we'll define the negative cone of E to be the set of all members of E, which are dominated by the null element in E. And we'll say that each member in the negative cone is a negative element. We'll say that E plus without the null element is the set of strictly positive members of E. We'll say that E minus without the null element is the set of strictly negative members of E. So this one is important now for the terminology that we recall that R is a respace. And so R plus is the set of positive real numbers. So R plus is the set containing real numbers which are greater than or equal to zero. So with the respace context, positive real numbers include zero and negative real numbers include zero, which is slightly different to our intuition. We often think of a positive real number to exclude zero. So in the respace context, by defining the positive cone as this, and R is a respace, we have that positive real numbers include zero. Um, so that's important if we ever talk of a positive real number. So then um, our last, our second last proposition is we'll say that um, if E is a respace, then we have the following. If F and G are an E plus, then F plus G is an E plus. If F is an E plus, then alpha F is an E plus for any positive real number alpha. If F is an E such that F and minus F are an E plus, then F is equal to zero. If F and G are an E, then F is dominated by G. If and only if G minus F is an E plus, and F is dominated by G, if and only if minus G is dominated by minus F. Then number five, if F and G are an E, then F is dominated by G, if and only if G is the supremum of F and G. And F is dominated by G, if and only if F is the infimum of F and G. And finally, if F and G are an E, then F is dominated by G, if and only if alpha F is dominated by alpha G for all positive real numbers alpha, and F is dominated by G, if and only if alpha G is dominated by alpha F for all strictly negative real numbers alpha. Uh, so to prove these statements, it's quite straightforward, since if F and G are on E+, plus, they both dominate the zero element in E. And so when we add them, they still dominate, their sum dominates the zero element. So all of these are straightforward to prove. So um, these ones will be left out. Um, as well as these statements over here, these are also straightforward to prove. So we'll say that if E is a respace, um, then if F and G are an E, then F soup G plus H is equal to F plus H soup G plus H and F inf G plus H is equal to F plus H inf G plus H. Um, we'll say that if F and G are an E and if alpha is a positive real number, then alpha F soup alpha G is equal to alpha times F soup G and alpha F inf alpha G is equal to alpha times F inf G. Then we'll say if F and G are an E and if alpha is a strictly negative real number, then alpha F soup alpha G is equal to alpha times F inf G. So here the order changes since alpha is strictly negative. So we can take absolute alpha to pull out the alpha and leave a minus floating around. And then we use the result um, that um, supremum of minus a is equal to minus infimum of a to get that um and alpha f inf alpha g is equal to alpha times f soup g and the last one if f g and h are an e then this result is telling us that the supremum is associative and the infimum is associative 
Now, it hasn't been pointed out, but now at this point, it should be pointed out that su the supremum is a, an associative commutative closed operation, a binary operation, and the infimum is an associative commutative closed binary operation. So now we'll say um, if E is a respace and F is an E, then the positive part of F is denoted F plus, and we define F plus to be the supremum of F and zero. The negative part of F is denoted F minus, and we define F minus to be the supremum of minus F and zero. And the absolute value of F is denoted absolute F, and absolute F is the supremum of F and minus F. So importantly, absolute F lives in the re space. So this absolute value, it's not a norm. Um, it's not a metric. It's nothing like that. It's not a mapping from the vector space to the real numbers. Um, it is a mapping on the vector space. So we cannot suddenly get a topology on the re space because of this absolute value. Um, so that just needs to be pointed out that the absolute value of f is still a member of the re space so now we'll say that if f is a re space and f, uh, if e is a re space and an f is an e then minus f plus is equal to minus f inf zero and minus f minus is equal to f inf zero so this one is quite easy to verify from the from this result over here, when we multiply by a strictly negative real number and apply it to the definition. So there we have the proof that if E is a re space and F is an E, then F plus is equal to F sub zero, which implies minus F plus is minus F sub zero, which is equal to minus F inf zero. And F minus is equal to minus F sub zero, which implies that minus F minus is equal to minus times minus f sub zero which is f inf zero so um i believe that this is our last result um so if f if e is a re-space and if f and g are an e then the following statements hold true f plus and f minus are members of the positive cone of e minus the positive part of minus f is equal to f minus the negative part of minus f is equal to f plus, and the absolute value of minus f is equal to f. Thirdly, f is equal to f plus minus f minus, f plus inf f minus is equal to zero, and the absolute value of f can be written as f plus plus f minus. Um, fourthly, we have that the absolute value of f is a member of the positive cone of E. Fifthly, we have that the absolute value of F dominates the positive part of F and it dominates the negative part of F, which live in the positive cone. We have that minus F minus is dominated by F, which is dominated by F plus. And we have that absolute F is the null element of E, if and only if F is the null element of E. And finally, F is dominated by G, if and only if the positive part of F is dominated by the positive part of G and the negative part of G is dominated by the positive part of F. So to prove this, the first one is quite easy to show. It follows from the definition. So um, F plus or minus is equal to plus minus F sub zero. Uh, so just that's some nice lazy way to write it all together. So it is clear that both zero and F are dominated by F plus minus. So this implies that F plus minus dominates zero, which means that F plus and F minus are in the positive cone of E. Now, secondly, the positive part of minus F is equal to minus F sub zero by definition. But minus F sub zero is the negative part of F. Then the negative part of minus F is equal to, by definition, minus minus F sub zero. But minus minus F is just F. So that's F sub zero, which is F plus. And finally, we have that the absolute value of minus F is equal to minus F sub minus minus F. 
So that's the definition, which is equal to minus F sub F. And by the commutativity of the supremum, we have that's F sub minus F, which is absolute F. Now we'll notice that F plus minus for part three, um, what we want to show uh, are these expressions. So we'll notice that F plus minus F is F sub zero minus F. So F sub zero is F plus. And using our distribute our, our results, which we have somewhere up here, using these results, which have been established, um, we have that F sub zero minus F is equal to zero sup minus F, which by definition is F minus. Um, and since the supremum is commutative, we have zero sup minus F is minus F sup zero. Now, if we rearrange the expression, F plus minus F is equal to F minus, we get that F is equal to F plus minus F minus. We also see that the null element in E is equal to minus F minus plus F minus. That's um, an, easy, uh, an obvious one. But minus F minus is F inf zero, which we've shown, plus F minus. So using our properties, which we have, this expression is F plus my um, F plus F minus inf F minus, which is equal to F plus inf F minus. And finally, absolute F is equal to F sup minus F. So we can rewrite this as 2F sup zero minus F which is the same as 2F plus minus F plus minus F minus, which then doing the algebra there gives us F plus minus F minus. And for property number four, since F plus and F minus are in E plus, we have that absolute F, which is equal to F plus plus F minus, lives in E plus, since F plus and F minus are in E plus. So for number five, it is easy to show that absolute F dominates F plus and F minus. Um, and this is clear from the fact uh, that absolute F is equal to F plus plus F minus. So if you just remove F minus, you have absolute F dominates F plus. And if you just remove F plus, you have absolute F dominates F minus. So the other results then with this property are then clear or are evident. So with this happening, it is clear that minus F minus is dominated by F, which is dominated by F plus, and absolute F is equal to zero if and only if F is equal to zero. So for the last one, if F is dominated by G, then let's exclude these parts here. We have that F sup zero, is dominated by G sup zero, since we're just applying the supremum with zero on both sides of the partial order. But F sup zero is equal to F plus and G sup zero is equal to G plus. So if F sup G is dominated by G, then F plus is dominated by G plus. And we also have that F minus is equal to minus F sup zero. And G minus is equal to minus G sup zero. So if F dominates G, then minus, if F is dominated by G, then minus F dominates minus G. And then taking supremum with zero on both sides, we get that F minus dominates G minus. Now, conversely, if we suppose that F plus is dominated by G plus and F minus dominates G minus, then this expression, we have that if F minus dominates G minus, then minus F minus is dominated by minus G minus. And so if we take this and add it with that, so the first inequality uh, or first expression add with this, we get that F plus minus F minus is dominated by G plus minus G minus. And by definition, this is F, and by definition, this is G. So we have that F dominates G. So very um, 
anticlimactically after going through all the preliminary results and definitions to finally define a respace and give some very basic results um that this has um reached the end as there's a lot more to do but as a time constraint we can't carry on forever um so what we have done here is we formally defined a respace and we have um, shown some basic results which hold in respaces but what has been presented is just enough to whet one's appetite it's enough to just begin working with respaces and we can develop far more results um, and far deeper results and we can work with um, linear operators between respaces um, we can construct what is called an f algebra um, we can deal with the tensor product of respaces um, and we can define a whole lot more stuff and develop further results um, and in fact <clears throat> we need a lot more results to state and prove um, Freudenthal spectral theorem but Freudenthal spectral theorem can be used um, when you work on the respace um it was yeah when you work on the respace m sigma of sigma additive signed measures we can use freudenthal spectral theorem to prove the radon nicodine theorem the standard radon nicodine theorem in measure theory um it's not exactly as easy as many texts claim it to be it is quite involved but the point is we can use this respace result and uh, the Freudenthal spectral theorem to get the classical result but we do need to develop a lot more to do that and what's more interesting once we've developed some results we can then apply these results elsewhere so for example we can apply these results to stochastic processes and so what's nice with that is we can develop results of stochastic processes when applied to sigma finite measure spaces rather than dealing with just ordinary probability spaces so while what has been done reached a dramatic nothingness um, it is set the groundwork for the ability to explore further and develop a richer theory so that is everything there is to do for today um, so thank you for that and have a good evening or day for you, I suppose. Oh, I beg your pardon. I can't hear you. I think I might have unplugged. No, 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 no. I'm fine. Okay. I, I didn't push a button. Um, are there any questions? So um, when I think about these lattices or partially ordered sets, I think about um, like graphs. Okay. You know, with uh, uh, sort of going from the bottom to the top and like seeing like chains like this. Yes. Um, but obviously respaces are way too complicated to have uh, a similar, like very simple um so, visual aid right yes uh, so i believe um with the normal lattices it's possible to draw i think it's called a husser diagram or yeah, yeah 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 yes um and so there is the visual aid with the husser diagram um but with the respaces it's um most of these are infinite dimensional vector spaces yeah um, yeah so, yeah no yeah yeah um and so it, it does become rather problematic to get a visual aid for it but a nice one will be r2 with the pointwise ordering you can see that um is that like a every, lexicographic ordering like i uh, no, no. so just the pointwise one so you'll say that x is less than or equal to y if and only if each component of x is less than or equal to oh, each got it, component got it. of y yeah um so that is a respace and then every member of the second quadrant of r2 is incomparable to every member of the fourth quadrant of r2 okay um got it and then if you draw a straight line in r2 then everything that then that straight line forms a chain in r2 mm -hmm. um Got so it. yeah 
R2 is a nice one to try visualize, but um, for it's it's rather an interesting note. So right, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the issue with a lot of this kind of stuff is that the trivial examples are too easy, and then the interesting examples are a big jump, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> And these are wildly infinite dimensional, right? Uncountably. Yes, yes. Definitely. Infinite. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I like work with infinite dimensional algebra, but it's at least like countably infinite dimensional. Um, right. Okay. So there's a question in the chat. Is there a good book recommendation on this topic? This person has finished undergrad, but has not started grad school. Um, I... I I didn't write it yet. Okay, yes. I remember um, you had so, it in the yeah in, in the, the abstract, abstract you sent me. Yes. So uh, the best uh, the best book I found uh, is Introduction to Operator Theory on Respaces by A. C. Zahnen. Uh, if I can, uh, oh, here's the chat. Um. Okay, so um, that would be, I would recommend that book as a good starting place. But um, if uh, then when you want to develop further, then you have to start reading lots of papers. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Are, yeah, so that, um, so if, if algebra is this topic of F algebra, um, I'm yet to come across a book which actually has an F algebra definition in it. So that um, I've only seen still in, in research papers. So it, it seems to be like um, a rather emerging field. Right. So how long is it? When were Reese spaces defined? Um, there was a paper by, uh, it's a, a Hungarian name. I think it's Friedrich, Friedrich Reese, as I would said. Um, he defined it in a, in a paper, I think in 1932, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, so it, it came after after the Lebesgue integral, um, and so I think he was working with that, um, and he saw how it was useful with the measure theory. Sure. But um, AC Zahnen, um, he's pretty much the guy who uh, developed respace theory and and really came up with lots of stuff and put it on the board so there's ac zonen and luxembourg and the pachter um are, are, are some of the big names in the respaces okay so um are you okay are you in the lineage of some of these people um I'm not so sure. I don't think I am. Okay. But um, uh, my supervisor, um, uh, he's a big enough hit in, in the respace area that we attended a conference and his child started crying and everyone stopped the conference for him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now he's, he's, he's a different, uh, a big hit in the respaces. Sure. Okay, great. Um, well, are there any other questions? Okay, well, let's, I mean, uh, you know, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah, That's thanks. A standard thing to say. Rushed, but um, if, if we can do some more, then we can go a bit more um, slowly and uh, I'll put some more examples then. Yeah, yeah, I'd be, I'd be psyched. I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch about that. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was great. Thank you for uh, speaking again. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, and I guess, I guess we're all good unless anyone has anything else.